All right, good afternoon. Welcome everybody. Welcome to Diversifying Your Classroom Bookshelf with the Cooperative Children's Book Center. My name is Jesse Nixon and I'm an Education Engagement Specialist with PBS Wisconsin Education. I'm so happy today for you to be here and to welcome the CCBC to tell us a little bit more about ways that we might diversify our classroom bookshelves. First note about the webinar function in Zoom. Many people asked about, am I automatically muted when I come in? Indeed you are, but we'd love to hear from you in the chat box. The default in the chat box is for your work to go or your questions to go directly to the panelists. So if you click on panelists and attendees, everyone can see your questions, your comments, and you can share resources in that same space. If you haven't already done so, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box as well. At PBS Wisconsin Education, we both make classroom media and facilitate professional development for educators across the state and beyond. Our media is free to use, standards align, Wisconsin focused for grades pre-K through 12. We have videos, games, interactive content, educator guides, and much more. We also facilitate professional development for educators, both in formal and informal settings, from early learning through high school. At PBS Wisconsin, we recognize that bias and unlearning the practice of racism demands education, listening, and action on all of our parts. And it's with this in mind that we've created this winter professional learning series, which we've titled Centering Black Excellence. Today, what you're about to listen to is part of that series. And the final part of that series will happen on March 16th with a Wisconsin mini ed camp chat. Throughout the last month, we've had lots of important conversations on, um, and on March 16th, we'd like to hear from you, let you have a chance to talk to other educators that have the same questions, same concerns, and have that time to really choose the topics that you wanna talk about. For more information, you can go to our events page at pbswisconsineducation.org slash events. And finally, as part of this winter professional learning series, if you attend two or more events, we'll send you a nice little bag from PBS with a tote bag, a certificate of attendance, and much more. Throughout the last month, we started off with a webinar teaching Black history using PBS digital resources. Earlier this month, we had a panel of educators with a critical look at equity across learning spaces. And it's today that we welcome the CCBC to learn a little bit more about how we might diversify our classroom bookshelves. And with that, I'm so happy to welcome um, Madeline Tyner and Mary Lindgren. Hi everyone, thanks so much for having us. We're really, really excited to be here. Um, my name is Madeline and I use they them pronouns and I'm a librarian at the CCBC and I will let Mary introduce herself quickly. Hi, so good to be here. I'm Mary Lindgren. I'm also one of the CCBC librarians. And I think I'm going to start things out with just a, a really quick introduction to the CCBC. So thank you, Jesse, for having us be here today. Um, really soon, we're going to get to talking about some of the books that we've recently appreciated. And I know that's mostly what you want to hear about. But before we get to that, I want to take just a few minutes to tell you about the library where we work. Um, and some of its resources. So the Cooperative Children's Book Center or CCBC is a library of the School of Education at UW-Madison. And we also receive funding from the Wisconsin Department of Instruction, of Public Instruction. So we serve university students and faculty, but also teachers in school and public librarians across the state. We're a library of books for children from birth through high school, and we serve the adults who work with those ages and would use those kinds of books. Publishers send us review copies of books as they're published, um, which in a typical year for the past several years has been about 4,000 new books that we get annually. This past year was definitely an exception as publishers struggled with um, staffing warehouses and the sort of logistics of getting books out. Um, but the books that we do receive are available for use at the CCBC, usually, 
So now we've been closed to the public since last March, but we're really looking forward to opening our doors again when the university gives us the green light, hopefully um, later this year, we can see it coming. But as a staff, we read a lot of those books. We create an annual recommended list. You can hear more about that soon, as well as subject specific bibliographies. And all of that is what prepares us to give presentations like these. So Maddie's going to jump in now and they will tell us a little bit more about what we do with all of those books. Yep, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and hopefully this works okay. Um, and I'm also going to turn my camera off just because I'm looking in many directions. So um, just so you know. All right. Share screen. Okay, is that working, Mary? It is. Yep. Okay, so um, really quickly, I want to mention that we have a new book search on our website uh, where you can search for books that have been recommended for the, uh, by the CCBC. You can use subjects and keywords and you can filter by audience age or diversity subject and so on. It's been really, really helpful. I think people have really liked it. Um, so please just know that's there as a resource if you need it. Um, you can also access CCBC Choices 2021 on our website. It just came out um, as well as a few additional book lists. We have um, a list on race and racism, black experiences, peaceful engagement. We think those are all really relevant to this presentation today. And I believe those links will be in the chat box, hopefully. And they'll also be up at the very end in case you missed them. So before we get onto the books, I want to give just kind of a brief um, overview of the statistics that we keep on diversity in children's and YA books. Um, so first, a bit of history. The CCBC started keeping track of the number of books by Black authors and illustrators and about Black characters and subjects in 1985. The CCBC director at the time, Jenny Moore Cruz, was on the Coretta Scott King Book Award, and she was really dismayed by the really small number of eligible books. I think there were something like 18 or 16. Um, so she started to count those books every year, and she just kind of kept going, and um, we're still doing it today. And then in 1994, we expanded the counting um, to include books by and about Latinx, Native, and Asian people. And then that went on until 2018 when we had a brand new database built, um, which really expanded our capacity for keeping track of various identities. So we added Arab, um, Pacific Islander, which had previously incorrectly been included within the Asian category, uh, white, LGBTQ+, religion, disability, gender, and character type, which means um, basically is the character a human, an animal, or something else like a truck or a potato or something, um, surprising number of sentient potatoes. So we examine every single book we receive and we keep track of these identities for primary characters, significant secondary characters, authors and illustrators, which gives us our by and about numbers, which we publish on our website every year. Um, and then, so um, over the years, um, we have um, seen books by and about BIPOC um, fairly steadily, but minimally increase. And the establishment of um, the organization We Need Diverse Books really helped. Um, I think that was in 2018, gosh, if I remember right. Um, and um, so I'm gonna show you just one example of a graph, let's see here. So here's, um, there are a lot, of, a lot of different ways that we can compare the numbers that we keep. Um, and so this is just one example. This is a graph of a stat that's gotten um, a fair bit of visibility lately. It compares the number of books with at least one author of the specified identities over the last three years. And keep in mind that the 2020 data is not quite complete because we didn't get as many books as we would have. And also because I haven't finished logging them quite yet. Um, but this is definitely most of them. Um, so, for example, in 2019, 6% of books had at least one Black author or illustrator, and 83.2% uh, of books had at least one white author or illustrator in the same year. So this is always kind of a really striking um, visualization of this data. Um, if you have any questions about the stats, you are more than welcome to email me 
or the CCBC reference email, which I think will be in the chat box um, and it'll also be at the end. Um, and there's also an FAQ on our website about the stats, which has lots more information than I have time to give here today. Okay, and so now we're gonna move on to the books. And this is, uh, we're gonna start with picture books for grades K through five. Oops, oh shoot, sorry. Uh, so first we have I Am Every Good Thing by Derek Barnes and illustrated by Gordon C. James. I'm gonna start by reading a little bit of it. I am every good thing that makes the world go round. You know, like gravity or the glow of moonbeams over a field of brand new snow. I am good to the core, like the center of a cinnamon roll. Yeah, that good. So what else is good about this young black boy? Well, he is one eye open, one eye closed, peeking through a telescope. He is a gentleman and a scholar, a difference maker, a roaring flame of creativity. He is Saturday mornings in the summertime, a highlight reel of magnificence, his ancestor's wildest dream. This is a picture book of first person statements that um, affirm black boys in all their diversity and magnificence. And the text is accompanied by these big, colorful, expressive oil paintings of black boys engaged in a variety of activities, building a snowman, jumping into a pool, performing with a microphone, playing sports, hiking, embracing family members. It's just wonderful. Um, the voice too is excellent. Um, it's sometimes joyful, sometimes playful. Uh, sometimes serious, but it's always genuine. And it closes like this. I am worthy of success, of respect, of safety, of kindness, of happiness. And without a shadow of a doubt, I am worthy to be loved. I am worthy to be loved. Next up, we have a nonfiction picture book, um, picture book biography about Elgin Baylor. It's called Above the Rim, How Elgin Baylor Changed Basketball by Jen Bryant. And I'm going to start again by reading a page of this picture book. And I want you to just imagine this athlete as I read. In one smooth move, like a plane taking off, Elgin would leap higher and higher and higher as if pulled by some invisible wire. And just when it seemed he'd have to come down, no, he'd hang there, suspended, floating like a bird or a cloud, changing direction, shifting the ball, twisting in midair, slashing, crashing, gliding past the defense, up, up, above the rim. And with a flick of his wrist or a roll off the fingertips, he put the ball in. I love that so much. The sentence just keeps going, just like the player keeps going. Um, almost as good as watching basketball, right? Uh, so this is the story, like I said, of Elgin Baylor, who grew up playing basketball on the streets of his neighborhood. As a black child in the 40s, he wasn't allowed in the parks where real hoops were located. And later, when he was old enough for college, he went out west to the College of Idaho because he wasn't allowed in whites only colleges in DC. But no matter where Elgin played basketball, people stopped and watched and asked him how in the world he did those moves. I don't know, he would tell them, it's spontaneous. As Elgin was leading college teams to championships and then joining the NBA, the civil rights movement was taking place in the world around him. He often faced discrimination. While his white teammates were allowed in restaurants and hotels when they were traveling for games, Elgin was not. Um, so he made this decision that he would um, sit down to stand up. He refused to play and people took notice. They weren't happy because they really wanted to see him. And the NBA made a new rule. No teams would patronize hotels or restaurants that practice discrimination. I think this is such a fantastic biography. It gives us a sense of who Elgin was and manages to capture the exhilaration of how he played, but it also provides so much important contextual information about the times in which he was living. The narrative kind of moves back and forth between Elgin and other activists of the time, all of whom are making change by engaging in acts of resistance, often like Elgin sitting down to stand up and these acts really capture people's attention. And here we are moving on to the winner of the 2021 Caldecott Award, We Are Water Protectors. This is just, um, well, as you might suspect, since it won the Caldecott, it's a gorgeously illustrated picture book, and it was inspired by the 2016 Standing Rock protests. The author, Carol Lindstrom, is Ojibwe Métis, and the illustrator, Michaela Goad, is Tlingit. It opens up with the young girl you see on the cover there describing how water is viewed among her people. 
Water is the first medicine, Nicomis told me. We come from water. The river's rhythm runs through my veins, runs through my people's veins. Her Nicomis says that water has a spirit of its own and connects the present generation to the past. And the girls people have talked for many years about a black snake whose venom would spoil the water and poison plants and animals. And now it has arrived. And in the illustration, we can see the menace of that black snake representing the Dakota Access Pipeline. And it just cuts right through these lush, really vibrant illustrations. It's a call to action for the girl and her people to stand together and fight for the water, not just for people, but also for those who can't fight for themselves, for the birds and the animals and the earth itself. The book closes with this. We are water protectors. We stand. The black snake is in for the fight of its life. So it's just a really powerful moment. The illustrations on those closing pages show all kinds of people across ages and races and ethnicities demonstrating their support of water protection. And there's really a great note at the end of this picture book. It has more information and it includes a statement saying this is not just a Native American issue, it is a humanitarian issue. And the next book um, is by one of my favorite authors, Meg Medina. She's this author who is just is so reliable at turning out excellent books, often middle grade fiction, or here in this case, it's a picture book, Evelyn Del Rey is moving away. This is a picture book for, I would say, younger elementary ages, and as the title suggests, it is about having a friend move away. And I'm going to read just the first um, two pages. Evelyn Del Rey is my major amiga, my numero uno best friend. Come play, Daniela, she says, just like she always does, just like today is any other day. So I bundle up and cross the street, a big truck with its mouth wide open is parked at the curb, ready to gobble up Evelyn's mirror with the stickers around the edge, her easel for painting on rainy days, and the sofa that we bounce on to get to the moon. Um, what we really see in this book are these two friends who have established routines, and today is moving day, but it's also a day no different than any other. They take the stairs two at a time, just like they always do, they have to sneak past their grouchy neighbor's door. They wave to another neighbor who's feeding pigeons through a window in the hallway. They live in apartments um, that have the same floor plan, but a few things are different. Evelyn's room is painted yellow and Daniela's is pink like cotton candy. Evelyn has a mommy, a puppy, and a cat, and Daniela lives with her mommy and a hamster. They're so similar, these two girls, in so many ways, just like their mirror apartments, but that will change today. So while the van's being loaded and the adults are working, emptying the apartments out, these two friends use an empty box to pretend they're driving around the city on a bus. But finally, their mothers tell them it's time to go. Evelyn and I, Evelyn and I hold hands in that wide, empty space. We lean back and start to spin in circles faster and faster until everything is a blur around us. Our fingers slip, but we don't let go until we wobble to the floor. We can talk every day after school, I tell her. And you can visit me this summer, she says, and spend the night. But I know that tomorrow everything will be different. Evelyn will be in a new home that doesn't match mine. Um, you know, there's that one last hug and then Evelyn is driving away. So this book also has a really satisfying last page after getting over that emotional hurdle. Um, that shows an older Daniela with a box of letters, and clearly she is still friends with Evelyn Del Rey. We really loved the descriptive details in this incredibly vivid writing and the sensibility that just feels so deeply authentic to childhood. It takes the reader right inside that last day together and also gives them the comfort of seeing a friendship that survives that separation. Next is Salma, the Syrian chef. It's by Danny Ramadan. And this picture book is about um, Salma and her mom who are living in a refugee center in Vancouver. They're trying to get their footing in a new country, a new culture, learning a new language, and they're really missing Salma's dad who has not yet joined them in Canada. 
he, uh, he still remains in the refugee camp overseas. And Selma has noticed that her mom seems worried and stressed all the time. She never laughs like she used to with her friends in the camp. So she sets out to make her mom laugh and she tries a couple things and they don't work. Um, and then she comes up with a brilliant plan. She will surprise her mom by making fool shami one of her mom's favorite Syrian dishes. She thinks Syrian food will do the trick. And so with the help of others at the community center, Salma prints out a recipe, shops for ingredients, and cooks the dish in her and her mom's apartment. She runs into a few snags along the way, but her neighbors really come through with assistance. Um, I, with this book, I love that you get um, a really strong sense of how stressful and difficult it is to be in a new country, especially for Mama. Um, she's doing job interviews, taking English classes. She's separated from home and her husband, of course, both of them are. Um, but Salma is so determined. She's so good at problem solving. Um, she draws the vegetables that she needs uh, when she uh, when she's going to the store since she doesn't know the English words for them. Uh, she knows when to ask for help from the adults around her. I also really love how this book centers Salma and her abilities. The narrative reads, she is scared of looking silly in this new place where hardly anyone knows her language. I like that it frames Salma as the one with the knowledge of the language and the established Canadians as the ones lacking in Arabic. Um, more than anything with this book, it's we just loved how the community and the refugee center really shines as the people support and encourage Salma in her endeavors. Next up is The Most Beautiful Thing by Kao Kalia Yang. And this book is also rooted in the experiences of a refugee, this time among family, and specifically a young girl, Kalia, who is also the author. So in telling this story of her childhood, Kalia focuses on her beloved grandmother. My grandmother is so old, the book begins, no one knows how old she is. Not me, not my big sister, duh, not our older cousin, Leigh. By the time Kalia was born, her grandmother, quote, already had an old woman's face. Her skin was soft, but dry like paper, and in her mouth was a single tooth. Some of the grandchildren helped to take care of their grandma. Lay washes grandma's clothes by, the, by, her, by hand in the sink. Duh washes her back in the bathtub with a soapy cloth. And Kalia clips her fingernails and toenails, a, a job that she really cherishes. From her present day narrative distance, Kalia loving re lovingly remembers her grandmother's feet, the roughness of her heels, the deep cracks filled with dirt from long ago and far away. When Kalia's grandmother was young, her parents died. She had to raise her siblings herself, struggled to find enough food for them. And now many years later and in a different country, Kalia's family struggles to make ends meet too. They eat bone broth without meat. Um, rather than buying treats from the ice cream truck, Kalia sucks on ice cubes and always remembers to offer her grandma one. And she really wants a new dress for the first day of school, but her parents just can't afford it. As she grows, she becomes more dissatisfied with her life. She wants braces for her teeth, which is just not possible. But her grandmother smiles at her, the same single tooth smile that Kalia has seen all her life and asks Kalia, is my smile not beautiful? And Kalia thinks about the hardships her grandmother has faced and her smile, which has always been present. And she thinks her grandmother's smile is the most beautiful thing. I love this book because there's so much emotion in it. You can feel, you can really feel the deep love and respect that this child and the other grandchildren have for their grandmother. Um, her grandmother is refre refreshingly presented as a whole person. She has a past and a personality. She's not just a one dimensional grandma character. And I love when Kalia describes the caretaking tasks. She says, and me, I got to clip her fingernails and toenails. Not I had to, or even I clipped, but I got to clip her nails. There's such joy for her in taking care of her grandmother. And I love the Hmong uh, cultural details. And I think it would be really meaningful for Hmong children to see themselves reflected in this way. And on top of the depth of emotion and the sense of family, the writing and illustrations in this book are just so beautiful. It was one of my absolute favorites of last year. We're going to move now into some fiction for elementary school children and starting out with Santiago's Road Home by Alexandra Diaz. Santiago is 12 years old. He's living in a small Mexican community when his aunt kicks him out of her home. He ends up spending the night in an abandoned shack and then the next day he meets Maria Dolores and she's a young mother. She is with her preschool age daughter, Alegria, 
and they offer him a meal. And this young woman's generosity with her food and her really honest, open conversation is almost a revelation to Santiago. He is not accustomed to being treated with kindness. He's been living in a really difficult situation. Uh, Maria Dolores, Santiago, and little Alegria band together. They decide they're going to travel to the border and then they're going to pay money to get a coyote to get them into the US. But a car accident along the way leaves them stranded shortly after they uh, cross the border. And so they attempt to walk through the desert to reach their destination. They start out really confident, but after a few days of walking through incredibly brutal heat and sun, they're dehydrated, they're near collapse when they are picked up by immigration patrol. Maria Dolores is in the worst shape of the three of them. She's hospitalized and Santiago and Alegria are sent to a youth detention center where they're immediately separated into gender segregated units and um, kept out of contact with each other. So I thought that everything that happens up to this point in the story, even that really dangerous life-threatening trek across the desert, somehow it felt like a trial that Santiago just needed to get through. But that tone really changes in the second half of this book, which is all about the six months Santiago spends in a border detention center. In that center, there are just not many ways to find hope. He does make a few friends. He connects with a compassionate educator who teaches him how to read. Um, the living conditions, though, are really bleak. And he's just pulled down by sadness at losing the first people who truly felt like family to him. And eventually, he starts feeling despair um, that they've deserted him. There's some um, incidents of abuse and humiliation by the guards. He feels really deep disappointment when he has a prospect for a foster home placement that, that evaporates just through some bad luck. Ultimately, Santiago's story has this very welcome happy ending, but I appreciated that the book and the author's note make it clear that for many juveniles, they experience even worse conditions in detention and after, um, although I think young readers are going um, to feel really positive about Santiago at the end of the story here. Next is Race to the Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. Um, this is about Nijane Bigay. She's a contemporary Diné or Navajo seventh grader. She has the ability to sense monsters, not supernatural beings, but monstrous humans. And one of these humans, a powerful white man named Mr. Charles, uh, who owns a big oil company, shows up at her family's house one evening. He claims that he's just there to take Nijone's father, who has just been hired by the oil company, out to dinner. But Nijone knows that Mr. Charles's intentions are nefarious, and so she bravely confronts him. Mr. Charles admits that one, he knows of Nijone's monster spotting ability. Two, he wants to make use of her brother, Mac, who has the ability to control water. And three, he is there to kill her. It turns out that Najona's mother, who disappeared years before, is a direct descendant of Changing Woman, a Navajo holy person. And Mr. Charles knows this. He knows that Najona presents a great threat to him and his business and must be removed. Thankfully, his murderous plan is disrupted for the moment. And Najona soon learns that she must go on a quest, along with her brother, Mac, her best friend, Avery, who is black and Navajo and a talking toy horned toad who guides them all to the Palace of the Sun, where they will be gifted the weapons needed to defeat Mr. Charles. And along the way, they have to pass through a series of dangerous obstacles that manifest in various ways, uh, according to what most frightens them. And they also meet with multiple Navajo holy people who help them in their travels. I've read a lot of the Rick Riordan Presents books, and I think this is one of my favorites. Um, it's pretty straightforward quest narrative, not convoluted and confusing, perfect for young readers, uh, and apparently for me, I don't want my fantasy to be too complicated. I really appreciate the theme of environmentalism in this book, which reflects a concern of many young people today, uh, but it's not heavy handed. Uh, I also thought the incorporation of Navajo cultural details and characters was really well done. And most of all, Nijone and her two companions are such incredibly likable heroes. Nijone is smart and determined, and she's so funny. I actually snorted out loud a few times while reading this. And next we have Root Magic by Eden Royce. And this is one of, I think, two 2021 books we have on this list. Uh, it's brand new. This takes place in um, or on Wadmala, an island 20 miles from Charleston, South Carolina. And many in this Gullah Geechee community rely on root workers for healing. 
while others are kind of suspicious, believing root work to be nothing but witchcraft or superstition. Uh, so the story opens at the funeral of Jezebel and Jay's grandmother. She was the island's best root worker, and many, many will miss her and her medicines. And although their mother does not approve and does not practice root work herself, Jez and Jay's uncle, Doc, begins to teach the 11-year-old twins root work as a form of protection against malevolent spirits, but also flesh and blood threats like this racist police, police officer, Deputy Collins, who's really been harassing their family lately. Jez isn't so sure she believes in magic or haints or boo, boo hags, the things that her grandma used to tell spooky stories about, but she eagerly attends her lessons and she makes her first root bag and hopes to use it to attract a friend. It's 1963, integration hasn't yet reached Wadmala schools, and Jez faces bullying by fellow Black classmates who believe that root work is old fashioned or only for uneducated people, but she does befriend Susie, who seems to be curious about it. And as the twins' lessons progress, really spooky things begin to occur. Invisible hands grab Jazz in the marsh. Uh, the doll that Gran made for her begins to speak. It turns out the magic is actually real, and it's particularly strong in Jazz. and someone or something may be trying to steal it. I thought this was just such a unique and empowering coming-of-age story. I love that it's firmly rooted in Jazz's culture. Um, as she takes on the responsibilities of root work, she has to both embrace her cultural heritage and also learn to harness her powers. Um, there's a strong sense of time and place in this novel. It's also beautifully written and truly, truly spooky. As a person who loves horror, I can attest. Mm -hmm. And I think it'll appeal to kids who are always asking for scary stories. And there definitely are those kids. Um, this is Renee Watson's book, Ways to Make Sunshine. It's about Ryan. She's a fourth grade um, African-American girl. She lives with her mom, her dad, and her older brother, Ray, in Portland, Oregon. And money has been tight for this family. Um, her dad was laid off from his postal service position. He does have a new job, but it doesn't pay as well as his old one. Their landlord has also decided to sell the house they've been living in, and, and so they have found a new place to live. It's actually closer to school, but it's smaller, and it's just noticeably not as nice as their old one. Ryan can really see many ways that um, this reduced budget is affecting her life. Some of them are smaller ways. Ryan is really a foodie, and um, she notices that her mom is just buying store brand ice cream now instead of the Ben & Jerry's flavors that Ryan really prefers. Meanwhile, one of Ryan's two best friends, Amanda, has moved to a big house in the suburbs. And Ryan just wonders, you know, does she still have a place in Amanda's expanding social circle at her new school? Ryan is also worried about an upcoming Easter event at church in which she has to speak in public. And then what is she going to do for the fourth grade talent show? She really loves to cook, but that doesn't seem like a skill that she can showcase um, in a talent show. And then she's also been intrigued by some distinctive hairpins that she finds in a tin high on her closet shelf in their new house. And she's trying to find out more about who might have lived there before her. We really loved a lot of things about this book, including there's this adversarial but also loving relationship that Ryan has with her older brother that just felt so authentic. There's her very realistic awareness of race that has just worked so seamlessly into what is essentially a pretty breezy chapter book. There's a scene, for example, when she's at a slumber party that involves going to a swimming pool, but Ryan is sitting on the edge because she doesn't want to ruin the hair. Actually, she's been directed by her mother not to get in the water to ruin the hair that her grandmother really spent a lot of time straightening for her. But then she can't resist a dare to see who can hold their breath underwater the longest. And then she, she has to cope with the consequences of what that dunking does to her hair. So, um, just really, really enjoyable from this author who's more well known for her books for young adults. We're so glad she's done something for middle grades. And then the next novel is by Kelly Yang, Three Keys. This is a sequel to her book from a few years ago, Front Desk. Um, but this is, you know, while it's going to be appreciated by readers who want more of Mia Tang's story, who read the first book, it also definitely works as a solid standalone novel. Mia and her parents are Chinese immigrants. They've recently purchased the Cala Vista Motel in Anaheim, California. And owning the Cala Vista along with investors who shared in its purchase is so much better than working for the previous owner. 
And life is really looking pretty rosy until Mia learns about Proposition 187. If passed, the ballot initiative in the upcoming California election would prohibit undocumented immigrants access to public education, healthcare, and other services. And she's just so dismayed by some of the racist and anti-immigrant things she's hearing as part of that campaign that she's also hearing from some of her classmates and even one of her teachers. Um, meanwhile, she started to develop a friendship with her classmate, Jason Yao, but that's causing some tension with her best friend, Lupe Garcia, who reveals finally that her mother once worked for Jason's family. When Lupe's father goes to Mexico for his, his mother's funeral, and then he is detained and jailed at the border on his way back home, all of these anti-immigration challenges become personal for Mia. She knows how hard Lupe's father works and the challenges faced by most immigrants and the sacrifices they make, including her own parents. She takes a really active role in trying to cause positive change in her life and that of her friends and family, including starting an immigrant support group at her school. But there's also a lot of realistic stress and worry in her story. Mia sees her own parents being so anxious and arguing over money and their inability to return to the kind of professional jobs they had before they came to the US. While some of the big plot issues in this book are resolved really hopefully, Proposition 187, as it did in, in real life, it does pass and its impact is realistically acknowledged. There is an excellent author's note at the end of this book that provides more background on Prop 187, which passed when the author, Kelly Yang, was 10 years old, and she remembers that vividly. She uh, says that she based all of the hate crimes in this book on actual incidents during this period in California history. Moving on now to nonfiction for grades six through 12. Our first book is a graphic memoir. It is by Victoria Jamieson and Omar Muhammad. And it's a memoir about a Muslim Somali boy, Omar, and his younger brother, Hassan, who have been separated from their mother and now live in a really huge sprawling refugee camp in Kenya. Omar and Hassan are happily looked after by a woman who lives nearby and kind of unofficially takes on a guardian role for the two boys. Omar is fiercely protective of Hassan, who has a developmental disability and also sometimes has seizures. He hesitates to attend school when, it, when the opportunity arises in the refugee camp because he's just afraid to leave Hassan alone and unprotected. He worries about what might happen to him. But eventually he does go to school and he really excels in his studies. But life in the camp is mostly a waiting game, waiting for more food, waiting in line for water, waiting to be called for an interview, to be resettled, hopefully in another country, to hear from their mother who may or may not be alive. As the years pass, this memoir uh, gives us a lot of details of the brothers' everyday lives and friendships. And in doing so, it does such a great job of looking beyond their experiences to illuminate the lives of um, others in the camp, uh, including women and girls who just don't have as many freedoms as the boys and men, uh, and people with disabilities whose needs are really not adequately met. I think this memoir strikes a really delicate balance. It doesn't shy away from showing the really harsh conditions of refugee camp life and just the emotional toll it takes on the kids um, having to live there and um, the trauma that they've been through. But it also doesn't come across as bleak or hopeless. Uh, and I really like that about it. And part of that is because um, in the back matter, there's such a wonderful update on Omar and Hassan with pictures of them. They're eventually resettled. Uh, they're doing well. And it, it, was a, it was an ending I was really happy to see after reading this. Um, this book is a collaboration between Omar and Victoria Jamieson, and she illustrates the book with these really bright colors, as you can see here, and um, easy to follow panels and speech bubbles, perfect for people, um, young people who are um, maybe just learning how to read graphic novels or just kind of getting used to that format. And another memoir, Everything Sad is Untrue, a true story by Daniel Mayeri. This is such a stylistically unusual memoir from the author who was born and lived as a little boy in Iran before fleeing the country with his mother and his sister after his mother faced government prosecution because of her conversion to Christianity. The um, three of them leave almost everything behind, including his father who chooses to stay. 
their refugee journey as his mother seeks safety and opportunity for her children. It eventually takes them to this unlikely destination of Edmonds, Oklahoma. And there, Daniel, who's now a middle schooler, tells his teacher and classmates stories about his life in Iran and about Persian culture using the Thousand and One Nights as a model and as an inspiration. Daniel really finds a lot about life in the United States really strange. He misses Iran and his father. He has lots of questions about his family, which now includes his mother's um, new and abusive husband. His story and the way it's told, it's just unlike any memoir I've ever seen before. Um, it somehow manages to strike this incredible balancing act of these poignant, thoughtful moments um, with the author's conversational, often very, very funny voice, as well as moments of meta narrative. It's it's a book that's received a lot of awards, um, and it's 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 pretty amazing and unique, I would say. Next up is our other 2021 book. This is Legacy: Women Poets of the Harlem Renaissance by Nikki Grimes. This is such a unique book of poetry. It begins with a preface that looks at uh, kind of the dearth of renowned historical women in a broad sense. So from famous scientists to um, ancient Egyptian pharaohs, the poets, it's most often men whose names have gone down in history. Uh, the, work of, the work and artistry of many women goes unacknowledged or has been forgotten. So in this book, Grimes focuses on Black women poets who wrote during the Harlem Renaissance in an effort to shed some light on their poetry, but also their lives and to celebrate the contributions that they made to the really large body of work that was created during that time period. So after this preface, she provides an introduction to the Harlem Renaissance itself. And this is followed by a brief but clear explanation of the golden shovel poetry form. This is the form that she herself uses throughout this book. Um, so I will let you know what that is. Um, it basically, a golden shovel poem basically takes a short poem in its entirety or a line from that poem. It's called a striking line. And it creates a new poem using the words from the original. So one word from the striking line comes at the end of each line of the new poem. So uh, this poetry, uh, the poetry in this book is in three sections. There's heritage, earth mother, and taking notice. And so Grimes, presents poems by a Harlem Renaissance poet with the striking lines in bold, and then she intersperses them with her own golden shovel poems created from those striking lines. The poems that she chooses and the ones that she writes herself are really complex but accessible, um, like much of her poetry, beautiful and empowering, uh, joyful and sorrowful. Many but not all of them are about blackness, black womanhood or girlhood, nature or a combination of these. And they're paired with these really wonderful, um, colorful full page art works by um, several different black women artists. And the back matter includes short biographies of the Harlem Renaissance poets, which was I thought was just as interesting as the poems. Um, like I said, this is just such a unique collection and it introduced me to a lot of poets that I'd never heard about as well as a form of poetry that I'm really glad to know. All 13, uh, The Incredible Cave Rescue of the Thai Boys soccer team is by Christina Sornhervat. And she is a Thai American author. She happened to be visiting her family in Thailand in 2018 when 12 young Thai soccer players and their assistant coach were trapped in a cave for more than two weeks. She, like much of the world, I imagine many of you can, can remember this so vividly, were following the story of the rescue effort closely, and then she continued to research it after she returned to the US. This survival story is incredibly tense and gripping, and it's also culturally nuanced because of the perspective the author brings. So she shows the technology and the engineering that went into the rescue um, efforts involving international cooperation, but also the problem solving, the logistical challenges, and all of the compassion and courage that were shown by, shown by so many people. We learn about the British divers who brought specialized deep water cave diving experience and their work with Thai and US military personnel. There's a Thai American engineer and entrepreneur who figured out a way to stem the flow of water into the cave system. And then there's local people who organized amazing support services for volunteers and families of the trapped players. 
There was so much overwhelming and ten tension and worry during these efforts, especially early on. Rescue um, was not only uncertain, many people involved thought it was really unlikely. And these dangers were underscored when a Thai Navy SEAL died. Um, communication was so challenging, not only because of the scale of the effort, because of, but because of the cultural differences between the Thais and some of the Westerners who were involved. For example, the first diver who reached the trap boys described um, how they met him with smiles. And that just seemed so positive and so upbeat. But the author of this book describes how encountering strangers with a smile is so deeply ingrained in their culture that, of course, that's how the boys appeared. Um, despite the incredible search situation that they were in. So there's a, it's a really excellent gripping text. And this book is also just chock full of photos. There's schematics, there's maps, and there's um, just all kinds of visual material that help explain the rescue. Next is The Black Friend on Being a Better White Person by Frederick Joseph. This is such a highly accessible and engaging guide to racism and anti-racism for young white people and adults too and it really covers a lot there are basics like stereotypes cultural appropriation the necessity of correctly pronouncing people's names terms one should and should not use and then there are more complex situations and concepts such as intersectional oppression how to respond to a friend's racism how to recognize bias and assumptions in yourself um, the author, Frederick Joseph, uses anecdotes of his own painful experiences with racism throughout his life to underscore and really clearly demonstrate the lessons that he provides in this book. And he also includes a lot of short interviews with activists, writers, rappers, lawyers, and lots of others kind of peppered throughout the book, and those provide additional perspectives and insight. In the back matter of this book, there's plenty of info to encourage continued learning, an encyclopedia of racism, as he calls it, lists of people to research, books to read, movies to watch, and songs to listen to to encourage continued learning. Throughout it all, I love this book because Joseph's uh, voice just really comes through. He's direct, he's genuine, and he's firm with his readers. He challenges white people to become not allies, but active accomplices, as he says, in fighting racism. And importantly, he points out that it's not the duty of black people to educate white people. Rather, this book is a gift in the form of an opportunity. And it's one that I hope many people will learn from. I put stamped on the same slide um, because these two books pair really well together. Uh, many people um, in the education and book worlds already know a lot about the excellent book Stamped. Um, so I won't go into too much detail, but it takes a more historical approach looking at the origin and history of anti-Black racism and the racial politics of the US. And um, it also compares three categories of people based on their beliefs. There's racist people, there's assimilationist people, and there's anti-racist people. So it contains a lot of history and complex ideas, but it's also incredibly accessible and has Jason Reynolds's really trademark, engaging, down-to-earth voice. Um, stamped is a young adult remix, as it's called, of Ibram X. Kennedy's book for adults, Stamped from the Beginning, and definitely worth checking out. We're going to move into our final section, some fiction for grades 6 through 12, starting with The Girl and the Ghost by Hannah Alkoff. So the girl in this case is Saraya. She lives in Malaysia with her mother. She's really lonely and her mother is sad and distracted. So when a palisit, which is a Malay term for an inherited spirit or demon that serves a master, um, this palisit that was once bound to Saraya's grandmother bonds with her after the old woman's death, its presence is really welcomed by this little girl. She names it Pink, she quickly grows to love him. Pink usually takes the form of a grasshopper and he goes with Soraya everywhere as her friend and protector. Now her grandmother, who, who was really a village witch, used Pink to hurt people. And although he feels a little bit uneasy about this aspect of his past, it's a really difficult habit to break. So when he hurts a group of kids who ignore um, Soraya, she forbids him from doing anything like that ever again. But then she makes her first true, really good friend, a girl named Jingwei. And Pink is so jealous of their relationship. He just can't suppress his anger. He acts out maliciously. And this is when the situation, which was sort of charming initially, starts to escalate. It gets scary. It gets even more dangerous after Soraya tells her mother about Pink and the healer that her mother hires has his own evil purposes. 
Um, she finally realizes the only answer is to lay Pink to rest once and for all. So she and her friend Jane set off on a journey to find the grave of the child Pink once was. We really love the exceptional characterization of um, Saray in this book that follows her from early childhood to early adolescence, as well as how this fantasy is so grounded in Malaysian culture and Islamic and pre-Islamic elements. There are some truly scary moments. Maddie mentioned earlier how some kids just um, so appreciate that in books, they'll like it here. There's also moments that are just wonderfully funny and moving in this book that's ultimately a, a tribute to friendship and family. Next is King and the Dragonflies by Kaysen Callender. And this is about Kingston, AKA King. He's a 12 year old black boy who lives in Louisiana and he's really grieving, his, he's really struggling. He's grieving his older brother Khalid who died suddenly and unexpectedly uh, right before the novel opens. And um, King is really kind of fixated on this idea that Khalid might return to visit him as a dragonfly. So he often spends time near the bayou just watching for the insects, hoping that his brother will somehow communicate with him. King also used to have a close friend, Sandy. Um, and Sandy is gay. And before Khalid died, he told King that King ought to stop hanging out with Sandy or else people might get the idea that King is gay too. And King really idolized and respected his brother. So he took his advice and he broke off the friendship with Sandy. But the thing is, King is gay, although nobody knows that about him and he can't quite figure out how to tell his parents. And he's also feeling guilty about how he treated Sandy. And then Sandy, who has an abusive father, runs away from home. So for now, he's hiding out in a little fishing shack near the river, and he also appears in King's backyard once or twice in the tent. And so King starts supplying him with food, um, and before he knows it, the boys have kind of revived their friendship, and maybe there's some other feelings too between them. This novel, um, we just loved how quiet and contemplative and just sensitive it is and how sensitive the characters are. Um, it really revolves around King's inner growth as he both grieves Khalid and also struggles with the idea that maybe Khalid was not perfect. Maybe it was wrong of him to tell King not to hang out with Sandy. Um, and perhaps there is space for King as a black gay boy and in the future as a black gay man in both his family and in the wider, wider world. Twins is a graphic novel written by Varian Johnson, illustrated by Shannon Wright. It's the first in a proposed series, and it stars two African-American sisters, twins, Francine and Maureen, and they've always been in the same classes until this year, sixth grade year. The quieter of the two, Maureen, is really upset when she learns she only has a couple of classes this year with Francine, who's really outgoing and confident. It feels even worse when she learns that the separation was something Francine, who is now asking to be called Fran, helped to engineer. Fran, who's also decided to run for class president. Maureen's anxiety about her life right now just really deepens with her own enrollment in a cadet corps. She's a great student, but she's not very coordinated or athletic. This is going to be hard for her. She needs extra credit to keep her GPA at its very high level. So when the cadet corps instructor says she can have some extra credit by taking on the challenge of running for class president, Maureen accepts and this pits her in the race against her twin. There's all kinds of resulting tension at home and at school and among their friends who feel forced to choose between them. This is just a very engaging graphic novel highlighting these two individuals who are struggling to balance their relationship as twins with their need to assert and explore their unique identities. And then moving to We Are Not Free by Tracy Chi. Um, this novel is about the incarceration of Japanese and Japanese Americans from the West Coast during World War II. It's told from the perspective of 14 teenagers, all of who are part of a group of friends living in San Francisco's Japantown when the story opens in March of 1942, and it follows them through the early months of 1945. The chapters alternate perspectives of these 14 characters. There's boys and young men and girls and young women. It shows their experiences throughout the war until just before the Allied victory in Europe. I thought it was incredibly powerful to read this novel from the perspective of these young adults whose anger and frustration is absolutely palpable as they navigate this untenable situation of incarceration 
In addition to family tensions, some of which existed before the war, some of which the war and their imprisonment foment. And all of this is layered on top of the usual challenges of transitioning through adolescence toward adulthood. Um, it's just an amazingly rich and accessible novel. It's complex and it's nuanced. It tells a story based on historical facts, but they are just brought to vivid life by these authentic characters. Each one is distinct and also connected to the others um, that are highlighted. The Henna Wars by Adiba Jigardar. This is a book about Nishat and Flavia. They are two of the few students of color at their Catholic high school in Dublin, Ireland. Nishat is Bangladeshi and Flavia is Afro-Brazilian and white. And Nishat met Flavia at a wedding and immediately developed a crush on her. And she was absolutely thrilled when Flavia started at her school. And even better, Flavia also happens to be queer and seems to reciprocate, reciprocate Nishat's feelings. But then things get complicated. For one, Flavia is related to China, who consistently bullies Nishat at school. And then when their class is tasked with creating a business for a class project, Flavia and China pair up and create a Mendy business. Nishat can't believe it. First of all, a Mendy business was her idea too. And worse, Flavia is appropriating an important part of Nishat's cultural tradition. Drawing henna designs is an art that has been passed down in Nishat's family, and she's been working really hard on her designs lately. So as the project progresses, Nishat isn't so sure about Flavia's feelings. Does she really like Nishat, or is she just trying to get ahead of the competition? Um, we love this novel because it balances so many threads and themes so well. Nishat navigates homophobia at school um, and at home. Her conservative parents feel her coming out will bring shame on the family. Um, it tackles issue, issues of racism and cultural appropriation. Um, Nishat also wades her way through a confusing romance like any good YA book. Um, but she's also got a wonderful, fully supportive sister who's got her back no matter what. And she's so refreshingly sure of herself and absolutely confident in who she is. And she is determined to do uh, what she knows is right. Next is A Lots Away by Darcy Little Badger. Um, Alatsue, also known as Ellie, is a contemporary Lipan Apache teen living in Texas. Her cousin Trevor has recently died, and shortly after his death, he visits Ellie in a dream to inform her that his death was not simply due to a car accident, he was actually murdered, and he needs her to help protect his wife and child. So Ellie, who has in inherited the ability to talk to the dead from her sixth great-grandmother, um, and whose deceased and very lovable dog Kirby remains with her in ghost form, teams up with her white best friend Jay and the two do some investigating. Their search takes them to a small town named Willoughby where a mysterious white doctor operates a secretive clinic and happens to live in a house guarded by vampires. Um, I should say vampires and other supernatural creatures exist in Ellie's world, which is otherwise very much like our world. And so Ellie and Jay have to work together, Ellie developing her supernatural abilities in order to uncover the doctor's nefarious plot and pursue justice for her cousin. Um, creatures, as you know, like vampires are nothing new, especially in young adult books. Uh, but this fantasy is incredibly imaginative in the way it integrates Lipan Apache history and stories with the contemporary and long lasting effects of and continuation of settler colonialism, all while remaining somehow an amazing page turning whodunit. I also love in this book that Ellie refreshingly has a close relationship with her parents and with Trevor's wife. She's really firmly grounded in her family and cultural heritage. And unrelated to the story itself, if you had this book in hand, you would agree. It's just so beautifully designed and made. Um, and there are really nice spot illustrations at the beginning of each chapter that show Ellie's sixth great grandmother's story. It just kind of progresses along with Ellie's. And our last book for today is The Magic Fish by Trung Lei Nguyen. Um, and this is another graphic novel. This is about Tian, who reads fairy tales aloud to his Vietnamese immigrant mother to help her with her English. His mother's been saving money for a trip home to Vietnam to see her own mother. But when her mother dies, um, Tian's mom finally makes that journey back to Vietnam. This sets the stage for the three interconnected strands in this graphic novel, Tian's contemporary life, 
his mother's trip home and the memories it inspires and the fairy tales themselves. And these three storylines are really wonderfully visually delineated with each having its own color scheme, it makes it very easy to track the stories as the book moves back and forth between them. Tian is secretly in love with his friend Julian. He is facing some homophobia from his Catholic school teachers, and he's also figuring out how he's going to come out to his parents. Uh, it turns out there isn't even a Vietnamese word for gay, and he is really struggling. His mother, who left Vietnam as a refugee, is burdened by both guilt and sadness at leaving her mother behind and not making it back before she died. And then there's the fairy tales, The Little Mermaid, um, and German and Vietnamese variants of Cinderella all connect thematically to both Tian's and his mother's struggles. And these three strands just weave together. They show the overlapping elements from the fairy tales, Tian's life, his mom's story. It is such a rich reading experience in this work that illuminates how the immigrant experience impacts across generations. The fairy tales also prove to be a bridge across generations, and it's one that connects Tian and his mom, even as he looks for a way to come out. The author and artist kept this really exceptional work with extensive endnotes that describe his decision-making processes, both in the story and in the art. And that in itself, I think, just gives amazing and welcome insight into the book's creative process. And that- and I will just add, the, the fairy tales are truly gruesome, just the way fairy tales should be. Yeah, exactly. They, they haven't been Disney-fied. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so here's a few resources. Uh, I mentioned them at the beginning. Uh, these are some links and of course our email at the bottom. You can always email us with reference questions or questions about the diversity stats. Anything is fair game. Thank you so much. Um, and everybody that's in attendance, um, please join me in thanking um, our presenters today. I don't know about you, but I just, my list of books that I need to read just grew exponentially. Um, and so thank you for sharing all of this knowledge with us and um, lots of love for you in the chat box. Um, so thank you so much. We're gonna share, and I've, we've shared a couple of times the, the list of books from today. And we'll also share um, additional information, all of the links that were provided for CCPC as well. Um, I do have two questions. Um, before we kind of conclude with this part. Um, one of the questions has to do with the graph that was shown at the beginning um, and kind of the data. And somebody wondered about, are those books in the USA only? Are those um, books across, across the world? That's a good question. Um, we do keep track of just USA only publishers and um, books that we get from other countries. And we do get a few, not very many, maybe a couple hundred, I would say, about out of our few thousand that we get. Um, so we do have those separated on our website for people who are interested. I think for that graph, I just used US publishers. I'm so sorry, I would have to double check. Um, if, it, if it is both, it would be really like the number of, um, of um, non-US books would be pretty neg negligible. It's pretty small. Thank you. Um, and one more question was um, the books that you have that have been described. To what extent do you know that the um, characters and the authors have shared identities? Um, I saw that I saw that question coming in, and so I was sort of looking through our list. It, I will say that we are putting a big emphasis on own voices right now, um, especially in our bibliographies that have subject themes. That that's a, a really important feature. Um, almost everything would have, that we talked about today had an author and those that are illustrated, typically also an illustrator um, that matched the subject of the book. I, you know, the one exception, Victoria Jameson is white, and but she co-wrote Omar Mohammed, who's, a, who's the co-author on um, When Stars Are Scattered, which is his memoir, so obviously his story. I don't know, Maddie, did you notice any others? Um, I think oh, Rebecca Jen Bryant. Oh, Jen Bryant, yeah. And Rebecca Roanhorse is um, indigenous, but I don't believe she's Navajo. Correct. I think she's Indonesian. And yeah. I think I think that came up in the chat too, where people were having questions because that is a book that there has definitely been divided opinion about. There's been some controversy yeah. um, about it. And 
you know, it's one of the conversations we've been having at the CCBC also is, um, you know, there also is not one perspective from the own voices community and as rightfully so everybody, you know, people are, have their own opinions. I don't know if you wanted to add anything else to that one, Maddie, I don't know if you saw that one come in. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you both. There's one more and I'll just ask, but this can maybe be something for later, but um, somebody said that um, if they might get access to the graphic of 2018 book character stats, they heard there was an updated version and where might they find that? Um, oh, you're right. Um, I, I'll have to, if they could email us, we would be able to find it more easily. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. Um, but can, we can definitely share any, any graphics we have. Yeah, just email us. Uh, my, uh, my colleague Muna will share um, email addresses as well as uh, there will be a follow up email to everybody that's attended today with a the list again, um, as well as links to the CCBC um, and a recording of this webinar. Um, while we're kind of um, getting towards the end, um, first I want to again thank you both so much for coming today um, and sharing all these wonderful books with us. I really enjoyed hearing about every single one of them and I wanted to go on forever. Um, so thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen to just tell you about two short things and about an upcoming event. Hopefully. All right. There are two resources that I'd like to tell you about that are new to PBS Wisconsin Education. Um, one of them, which was just released this month, is called Why Race Matters. This is a nine part digital series focused on important issues affecting Wisconsin's black communities. And you can access that at pbswisconsin.org, why race matters. And the second, which is new to PBS Wisconsin education, we released a series of videos and blog posts. It's called AKA teacher. That is all of the hats that teachers wear every day in this, there are blogs and videos written by and for Wisconsin educators where they share insights and strategies for managing everything that comes with being an educator. In March, the blog post and video is what does anti-racist education look like? So um, you can go to pbswisconsineducation.org aka teacher to find out and read a little bit more about that. Our final event in this series, again, is taking place March 16th from 3.30 to 4.30. This is an EdCamp chat. That means that when you register, you'll be asked, what do you wanna talk about? We'll create groups based on those topics and you have the time to talk to other educators about the things that you most want to talk about. We're excited for this, um, this event, so please be sure to register today. Finally, um, thank you so much. Thank you to the CCBC. My name is Jesse Nixon, and you can contact me if you have any questions and look forward to an email coming to me that has all the information from today's webinar. Thank you so much.